Okay, so we're ready to start. My voice is okay? Yes, Svante, we can okay. hear you. Okay, so we're going to begin. We'll do the three vows to the Buddha, even mentally. One, two, three. And then we'll do the, I'll do the salutation, one time salutation. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Homage to the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Okay, so good morning, everybody. And today is September 28th. 2024. And we're continuing now with our reading of the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourses. We're in the Book of Sixes. In the Book of Sixes, and we come to Sutta number 61. It just has the short title, the middle. And this is an interesting discourse in that it shows, in a way, the value we call this in Pali, Dhamma Sakacha, which means discussion on the Dhamma. And it's mentioned in the Mangala Sutta. It's one of the blessings mentioned in the Mangala Sutta, Kalena Dhamma Sakacha, that is, at the appropriate time, holding discussion on the Dhamma. And the reason why this discussion on the Dhamma can be beneficial is that it shows how a particular topic or theme can be viewed from different angles, different perspectives, which are not necessarily in contradiction to one another, but they can highlight the topic from different angles, different perspectives, showing it from different points of view. And so, interestingly, the sutta begins when the Buddha is living in the deer park at Isipatana near Benares. And that is the place where, as probably everybody knows, that's where he began his teaching career by turning the wheel of Dharma. But apparently this sutta takes place at a somewhat later time because he already has a group of monk disciples, and they're discussing another passage spoken by the Buddha. And so as we read on this particular occasion, after the monks have returned from their alms round and they've had their midday meal, then a number of the senior monks have been sitting in the pavilion hall, and one of them brings up the topic. Here he refers to a, and this is interesting, it refers to a particular group of suttas as if they had already been collected into a fixed text. And this text is called the Parayana, which means the way to the beyond, or the process of going to the beyond, going to the far shore. And this text or collection comes to be collected into the work called the Sutta Nipata, and it becomes, it gives, it's given the title, the Parayana Vaga. In the Sutta Nipata, it's called the Parayana Vaga, the chapter on the way to the beyond. But it seems almost certain that the Sutta Nipata is a later collection which brings together a number of other suttas which were sort of free floating, as well as two established collections. One is called the Uttaka Vaga, the chapter on the eights, and the other is the Parayana which comes to be called the Parayana Vaga, the chapter on the way to the beyond. 
And the Parayana Vaga, sort of the setting for this collection, is a group of young Brahmins. They are all the students of an elder Brahmin named Bhavari. who is very old, too old to go to visit the Buddha himself. And so Bhavari hears a report that a fully enlightened one has arisen in the world, and he's now living, Bhavari himself is living in a section of India, which now might correspond to the state of Karnataka, maybe even, um, the state where, well, this is old age, where, where Bombay is, where Mumbai is located. Maharashtra. Maharashtra, Maharashtra, of course. It could have been the northeast portion of Maharashtra. And so it's quite distant from the area where the Buddha is living and wandering and teaching. And so he has these 16 students, younger Brahmins, and he sends them on this mission to the state of Magadha to find out, or Magadha or Kosala, to find out whether this sage of the Sakyan clan, this, the one that they call Gotama, whether he's truly a fully enlightened one. And so the 16 Brahmins travel all over. First, they travel all across India, and they think that the Buddha's living at Savati, and so they come to Savati and ask, where is the Buddha? Or where is, this, where is the ascetic Gotama? They don't yet call him the Buddha. And they, the people tell him, oh, he's not staying here now. He's gone to Rajagaha. And so they travel in all the ways down. Savati is now in the state of Uttar Pradesh. And... Rajagaha is in the state of now contemporary Bihar, in those days the state of Magadha. So they travel down to Magadha, to Rajagaha. They ask, where is the, um, where is Gotama, the ascetic Gotama? And then they, they're told that he's staying at a particular Chaitya, the Pasana Chaitya, which is a bit outside of Rajagaha. And so they travel to the Pasana Chaitya, and there they see the Buddha surrounded by his company of monks. And then each of these young Brahmin students asks the Buddha a set of questions in verse. And then the Buddha replies to them in verse. And so what we have here is a verse taken from the questions of one of those young Brahmins, whose name was Tisa Meteya, or in brief, Meteya. It's the same name as that of the future Buddha, the Buddha Meteya. And so Meteya, has asked the Buddha, let me see if I could find the original questions. Okay, I'll put the original questions in. Hmm. 
Okay, do you see this other file? Yes. Called... Yes, Bhante. Okay. So this is verse 1040. These are the questions of Vaitaya. So he asks, who here is contented in the world? For whom is there no agitation? Who, having directly known both ends by reflection, does not get stuck in the middle? Whom do you call a great man? Who here has transcended the seam seamstress? And then the Buddha replies, actually there are two verses in the reply. So the Buddha says, one leading the spiritual life, or this could also be understood as the celibate life among sensual pleasures, one who is without craving, always mindful, the monk who is quenched, having comprehended things, for such a one there is no agitation. Then the Buddha continues, having directly known both ends by reflection, one does not get stuck in the middle. I call him a great man. He is the one who here has transcended the seamstress. And so the sutta that we're looking at in the Anguttara Nikaya, so apparently the monks are already familiar with this collection called the Parayana. It had been apparently compiled and was in circulation orally during the Buddha's time. There were no written texts, so the monks didn't have, couldn't go to the library and take out a book or go to amazon.com and order a copy of the Parayana Vaka. <laughs> but you have to hear it orally, the oral transmission of the text and probably with some commentarial style explanation. And so one of the monks brings up this verse in this collection. So it's part of the Buddha's answer, having understood both ends, here it's translated the wise one, in the other translation I have, by reflection, one does not get stuck in the middle. I call him a great man or great person, one who has here transcended the seamstress. <clears throat> And the seamstress is one who ties, sews things together. And so now this monk is bringing up a series of questions based on the verse. So we have both ends. So what is the first end? What is the second end? What does it mean? to get, I would say no, does not get stuck in the middle. What is meant by the middle? And what is the seamstress? And so now apparently we have, maybe there's a larger group of monks, but there are six monks who are going to express their opinions, their interpretations, which is why the sutta is in the book of sixes. Okay, so the first monk speaks up and says, contact, is one end, the arising of contact is the second end, the cessation of contact is in the middle, and craving is the seamstress. For craving sows one, the person, to, to the production of this or that state of existence. And I think this note here I took the explanation from the commentary, and sometimes I don't agree with the commentary, or at least I can offer alternative explanations. Okay, so this is what the commentary says. We'll increase the point size. So the commentary says, the contact at the first end is one individual existence, which is produced by way of contact. The origin of contact is the second end, 
or the, sec the, the origin of contact, that is the second end, that is the future existence, which is produced through the contact of the karma done in this existence as its condition, then what is in the middle is the cessation of contact. And the commentary says, the cessation of contact is Nibbana, and Nibbana is said to be in the middle because it cuts in half craving, which is the seamstress. And I find this explanation a little pr problematic, even though I have to say, okay, at the end of the sutta, as we'll see, the monks will come to the Buddha, they will relate to the Buddha their, the discussion that they had, and then they'll ask the Buddha, which one of us has spoken correctly? Let's just jump to the end, and then we'll go back. Okay, so after six monks have spoken, so one of them says that we have each explained according to our own inspiration or our own ideas, our own point of view. Let's go to the Buddha and report this conversation to him, and then we'll get the answer from the Buddha, and then we'll remember it. And so they all go to the Buddha, they relate the entire conversation, and then they ask, which one of us has spoken well? And then the Buddha says, in a way, you have all spoken well. So you've each spoken from your own point of view. And in a way, you could understand, your, we could accept your explanation as being well spoken. But this is what was intended by me when I stated that verse in the Parayana. And then the Buddha will confirm the explanation of the first monk. He says, contact is one end, the arising of contact is the second end, the cessation of contact is in the middle, and craving is the seamstress. For craving sows or ties, ties one to the production of this or that state of existence. And so the Buddha approves the explanation of the first monk in this group. So he says that they've all spoken well. But I find the explanation, the commentary, a little bit problematic because we have one end is contact. The other end is the origin or the arising of contact. And then in the middle, we have something in the middle. So what is in the middle? And the commentary says that Nibbana is in the middle. But if Nibbana is in the middle, then it, Nibbana cuts the connection between the one contact and the arising of the next contact. Actually, that might be the case. It just occurred to me that that perhaps could be accepted. But we think of craving as sowing one contact to the other. So if Nibbana comes into the middle, then the possibility of moving on to the second contact is obliterated. Doesn't that make sense? Yeah, so the way I interpreted it, I'll bring it to the Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, he's gone, to he's, in, he's gone to Nirvana, okay. Okay, so I say it would be better, make better sense to see here, Pasani wrote at the cessation of contact here, not as Nibbana, but as the ceasing of contact at the end of the first existence. So we have one existence and contact is repeatedly occurring in the course of that existence. Then we have death takes place, and so there's a seizing of contact with death, and then there is the arising of contact again in the next existence. So that is the origin 
or the arising of contact. And craving is then the seamstress because craving is what ties the previous existence with its contact to the second existence in which craving arises again. And so in that case, the cessation of craving, I'm saying the cessation of contact is the break that takes place between the two existences. And so contact, first, what is, what is contact? So contact is always explained as the encounter or coming together of consciousness with its object through a sense faculty. And so we have six sense faculties, six objects, and six types of consciousness. And so the, through the entire course of life, objects are always impinging on one or another of the six sense faculties. And then con uh, consciousness is arising with, in response to the prominent objects that arise through the sense spaces. And so when consciousness encounters that object through the sense organ or sense faculty, that encounter is what is meant by contact. And so through the entire course of life, from birth to death, even from the Buddhist standpoint, even during the period in the womb, contact is constantly taking place with an object. And so at death, we could say that there is a cessation of contact, a sort of break in the series, the flow of consciousness with the contact with objects. So that cessation of contact, temporary cessation, takes place as at death, but then craving is still operative in the mind. And so craving sows this existence to the next existence. In other words, craving brings about the arising of a new existence in which contact will again play the prominent role as being the first moment, the first occasion in a process of perception, a process of cognition. And so craving sows one, that's the person, to the production of this or that state of existence. So craving is what ties us to one or another state of existence in this cycle of samsara. And so we have, you know, traditionally we have the five realms of existence, hell realms, the realm of the animals, the realm of the pratas or afflicted spirits, human beings, and the divine realms, celestial realms. And so when we pass away as human beings, we're going to arise, unless we attain final liberation, we're going to arise in one or another of these states of existence. And what sows us, ties us to these different states of existence is craving. It could be this coarse type of craving, sensual craving, which will tie us to the lower states of existence, including the human realm, or it could be a subtle craving for, you know, celestial bliss, peace and tranquility, which ties one to the celestial realms, the divine realms, the Brahma world, the formless realm. But wherever craving is operative, renewed existence takes place. And so the Buddha speaks about, you know, we have to continue that one understands both ends without getting stuck in the middle. Yeah, in fact, this makes sense. If the middle of the two types of 
Okay, we have contact, the arising of contact. If we follow the commentary, the, the middle is Nibbana, then it would say that the wise one doesn't get stuck in Nibbana. But from the standpoint of early Buddhism, that wouldn't make sense. <laughs> maybe from the standpoint of maybe Madhyamaka philosophy, they say that <laughs> samsara is one end, nirvana is the other end, one doesn't get stuck either in samsara or nirvana. But in early Buddhism, the goal is nibbana, and so the text wouldn't speak about getting stuck in nibbana. Okay, so then the passage begins that the monk directly knows what should be directly known and fully understands what should be fully understood. And by doing so in this very life, he makes an end of dukkha, an end to the suffering of the round of birth and death. And these two words seem, or two expressions seem rather similar, but there's a subtle difference in the nuance. We have what is called direct knowledge, which in Pali is abhinya, and then the other is Abhinya and Parinya. Yeah, this NY represents the N, double N with the wiggle on top. So I think the commentary explains this. Okay, so what, what should be directly known? Yeah, here we have it. Abhinyayang is the Four Noble Truths. So direct knowledge applies to all Four Noble Truths. And what should be fully understood is the pair of mundane truths, suffering and its origin. And then it says, in this very life, he makes an end to the suffering of the round, that is the round of birth and death. And so first comes direct knowledge, sort of direct knowledge is more preliminary type of knowledge. It's a sort of preparatory knowledge and then when that preparatory knowledge is established, then comes parinya, the full understanding, which is the understanding that brings liberation. Okay, so this is the position or the interpretation of the first monk to speak. Okay, now the second monk in the group speaks up and he gives his interpretation. The past is one end, the future is the second end, and the present is in the middle. And again, craving is the seamstress. So this is quite easy to understand. And so we have, we could take the past even within this life. So starting from this morning, going to yesterday, going back last year, all the ways to my childhood, and then the future going to this afternoon, tomorrow, all the ways to the future in this life. But also we could say the past is the past life, the future is the future life, this life is the present and craving is the seamstress. And that makes sense because craving is what ties together, okay, the past life to the present life and it ties together this present life to the future life. And so craving sows one to the production of this or that state of existence. So that's the second interpretation. Okay, then we come to the third interpretation. 
Okay, so here this monk will explain by way of the three kinds of feelings. So pleasant feeling is one end, painful feeling is the second end, and then the neutral feeling, that's the feeling neither painful nor pleasant, is in the middle, and craving is the seamstress. Again, for the same reason, because craving sows one to the production of this or that state of existence. You know, sometimes I have to say that these interpretations seem clever, but it's a bit difficult to connect them to this idea of craving, tying one to the production of this or that state of existence. Because these feelings will succeed one another for an ordinary person or for the arahat, there'll always be pleasant feeling, painful feeling, and neutral feeling. Anyway, we'll just move on. Okay, now we come to the fourth interpretation. And here I think I have some reservations. I would offer a different explanation using the same terms. But this monk says, Okay, name is one end, form is the second end, and consciousness is, consciousness is in the middle, and craving is the seamstress, for craving sows one to the production of this or that state of existence. Okay, so this passage is building upon this term. Let me get the Pali term here. is Nama Rupa, and this was a word Yeah, this is a term that the Buddha took over from the Brahminic texts, and we find this word used, for example, in the Upanishads, this is the final portion of the Vedas in which Nama Rupa appears to be used to represent the entire phenomenal universe. So I think it's said that all of this phenomenal universe is Nama Rupa, where Rupa will be the things that appear. For example, it will be colors, sounds, odors, tastes, touch sensations, everything that appears is rupa, and nama will be the concepts that, that we superimpose on the things that appear, the scheme, the conceptual schemes through which we sort of process and assimilate the things that appear. And all of that for the Upanishads is mere appearance. And underlying that is the supreme reality of Brahman or the Atman, the ultimate reality. Okay, the Buddha took this word or this expression, Nama Rupa, over from the Brahminic text, but gave it a somewhat different explanation. And we find this explanation, for example, in the suttas on dependent origination where the Buddha effectively uses Nama Rupa to represent what we might call the psychophysical organism. So Rupa, he identifies as the four primary elements and the derivative types of matter. For example, colors, sounds, odors, or the, or the matter of the sense organs. And then nama, though it originally means name or concept, he identifies with a set of mental factors that are essential to cognition. 
So Nama includes contact, let's use the English, contact, feeling, perception, volition, one, two, three, four, and attention. One, two, three, four. So these five make up Nama. So in all experience, there is the physical body with its sense faculties representing Rupa, and there are these mental factors, this group of mental factors representing Nama or constituting Nama. And then in the formula for dependent origination, we have vijnana, which is consciousness. And so it's said that nama rupa arises in dependence on consciousness, and consciousness in turn arises dependent on nama rupa. Since the psychophysical organism, this is in the rebirth process, in the rebirth process, sort of the primary carrier or conduit of the rebirth process is consciousness. Consciousness is what flows on from the previous life into the new life. And in the case of a human birth, consciousness is what settles initially in the mother's womb, connecting with the ovum, the fertilized egg, and then once consciousness gets settled into the fertilized egg, then it brings along rupa, the material side of existence, and nama, the mental side of existence. So in this way, consciousness is the condition for name and form, but name and form are also the condition for consciousness, since whenever consciousness functions in the course of life, Consciousness depends on this physical body. Take away the physical body, there's no consciousness. Consciousness depends upon not only the entire body, but particular sense organ, the eye, ear, nose, tongue, or physical body, the brain. And it depends upon the object. And then consciousness, whenever consciousness arises, it depends upon contact, feeling, perception, volition, and attention. So the two condition each other. Okay, so this is why I don't so much agree with this explanation. So this explanation says name or nama is one end Form is the second end, and consciousness is in the middle. It seems to me, I would put it this way. I would say consciousness is one end. Please pardon me for disagreeing with you. <laughs> Consciousness is one end, and form, or materiality, is the other end. And then I would put nama in the middle. Because what is nama? So we have the, this group of mental factors. And so let us say, Okay, we have here the cup. So the form of this cup, the shape of this cup, sort of through the eye. Yeah, so we have the eye organ, the cup, and depending on the, depending upon the matter of the cup, depending on the matter or form of the eye, there arises eye consciousness. And then through the meeting of consciousness 
with the form of the cup, there occurs contact, and then through contact, there occurs feeling, perception, volition, and attention. So the mental factors seem to arise. So consciousness is the sort of presupposition for any kind of awareness or cognition to take place. And then there's the material form that impinges on consciousness. And then these particular mental factors arise assisting in the act of perception or cognition, feeling the cup, perceiving it, having some volition in response to it, the volition of maybe picking it up to take a sip of the drink. And of course, there's the attention. Initially, there's the attention to the cup. So doesn't that make sense? It doesn't make sense. Sense object doesn't have to be just form. Right? There could be mental sense objects. There can be mental objects, but here we're speaking about nama rupa. So what is the role of rupa here? Excuse me? It seems to me that we're trying to fit something. We're trying to do, get an explanation to fit into something. It just doesn't fit very well. Yeah, but it seems to me that the explanation in the sutta doesn't fit very well. <laughs> so if we're going to sort of try to fit, what's the expression? A square, is it a round peg into a square hole? Or is it a square peg into a round hole? <laughs> it's a matter of which square peg fits better into the round hole. <laughs> anyway, this is my interpretation. I'll try to jump and finish the sutta, then we'll take some questions. OK, number five. Again, I have some disagreements here. <laughs> OK, OK, so here. This is the fifth monk says, the six internal bases are one end, the six external bases are the other end, and consciousness is in the middle. Consciousness is in the middle and craving is the seamstress. Okay, so what are the six internal bases? So that is, these are the six sense faculties, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body base, and the mind base, as the mind is an organ of cognition. The six external bases are the six objects, visible forms, sounds, odors, tastes, textures, and mental objects. And then consciousness can be of the six kinds, consciousness of any of the six consciousness that arises through any of the six sense bases. Okay, so it seems to me not to make good sense to put consciousness in the middle, but the way I would sort of reformulate another Bodhi heresy. Okay, so we have on one end let, let us start from the far side. So we have the external objects, the external bases. And then to cognize the external bases, we need consciousness. So we have consciousness. But then I would put the internal sense bases in the middle. Just take the case of visual cognition. So we have the external bases, the form, the colors, shape. So this would be the colored shape of the cup. And then knowing the colored shape would be the work of consciousness. But what we need in the middle for that form of the cup to become available to consciousness, we need the eye organ that is the internal sense base, which seems to come in the middle between the external object and consciousness, right? Does that make good sense? You have to say yes. <laughs> yes, but. But the internal is supposed to cut off the two ends, rather than connecting the two ends. 
craving connecting the two ends. But then without internal basis, how can you connect the external basis with the consciousness? The middle one is the one that cuts off. Where does it say the middle one cuts off? Only the commentary said that. <laughs> okay. So the sutta said that in the explanation, in its interpretation of the first one, it said that the cessation of contact is nibbana, because nibbana cuts off the connection between this existence and the next existence. But if we don't look at the commentary, so what cuts off craving? It doesn't speak about anything that cuts off craving, but craving is what sows one as the person to the production of this or that state of existence. Craving is a seamstress, but it seems that a seamstress ties together two portions of cloth. I don't know. Can we just stay Buddha's words on it? <laughs> Can we stay with what? Just stay with the Buddha's words, what Buddha approves and what Buddha says. <laughs> yeah, but the Buddha didn't really say anything about the other five explanations. He just said... Exactly. Yeah, so we world. can also ignore them then. <laughs> okay, we'll just finish. We'll come to the sixth one. I think the sixth one is actually, the, in a way, the clearest. But here the text that uses a rather technical expression, which I translated personal existence. <clears throat> but let me go to the Pali word. First, we'll, we'll take the, the, the translation. So personal existence is one end. The origin of personal existence is the second end. The cessation of personal existence is in the middle and craving is the seamstress. For craving sows one to the production of this or that state of existence. Okay, I might be in trouble here. Oh, let me go to the other file. Okay, so the word translated as personal existence is sakaya, which is a compound of sat, which means existing. And the word kaya literally means body, originally means body, but it's not just the physical body, but it's the entire um, collection of factors or complex of factors that makes up one's individual existence. And so when you combine sat and kaya, it turns into sakkaya. And this is taken to be equivalent to the five aggregates. Yeah, let's see how the commentary explains this. Yeah, it says that personal existence is the round of existence with its three planes. That's the three different realms of existence. The origin of personal existence is the truth of the origin, which is craving. So that is the second end. So this, the origin of personal existence, so this is craving is the second end. The cessation of personal existence is in the middle. And the commentary says, the cessation of personal existence is the truth of cessation. And that is Nibbana. So Nibbana comes in the middle. Again, I don't see how Nibbana can come in the middle between personal existence is the five aggregates the origin is craving. So how does Nibbana come in the middle between the five aggregates and craving? Okay, but then I offer my alternative interpretation. So here, personal existence as one end is the present existence. 
the origin of personal existence is the arising of the next existence. And then here, the cessation of personal existence, not Nibbana, but the seizing of the present existence that is at death. And then craving is what generates rebirth. And so craving sows this present existence to the next existence, to the future existence by generating rebirth. Okay, so that takes us through the six interpretations of that verse. And then this is the passage we've already covered. So one of the monks says that we have each explained according to our own ideas, our own interpretation. Let's go to the Buddha and report this matter to him. And so they go to the Buddha, they report it. And then the Buddha says, in a way you have all spoken well, but as to what I actually meant when I spoke that verse in the Parayana, what I meant is contact is one end, the arising of contact is the second end, and the cessation of contact is in the middle, and craving is the seamstress. For craving sows one to the production of this or that state of existence. And then concluding, it is in this way that a monk directly knows what should be directly known, fully understands what should be fully understood. And by, sowing, do, by doing so in this very life, he makes an end of dukkha. Okay, I could take, try to take some questions. <laughs> Maybe people have different interpretations. Okay, so let us see where the questions are coming. And so, in the order in which I see them, Tong Van, Tong Van, you can unmute to ask the question. Okay, okay. Good morning, Pante. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I want to know because we are born from craving. The craving make us living today. Craving is? We are living by Oh, let me get craving. the, wait, there's this earphone that helps me to hear the question more clearly. Can you hear me, Pante? Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Because we are born, we are born because of craving. Craving is the force of our rebirth. So in order to cut off the rebirth, yeah. we need to subdue the craving or eliminate the craving. Yeah, that's exactly correct. Okay. So in this way, we need to practice the Eightfold Path. We need to practice oh, to the, cultivate the Eightfold Path. Yeah, cultivate yeah. The, the Eightfold Path. Right. Is it is it correct? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, that's correct. My question is how can we live in a lay life to practice that fully, the Eightfold Path? I'd say it's quite difficult to <laughs> cultivate the Eightfold Path fully. <laughs> Both in lay life and monastic life, it's always difficult. <laughs> but one has to do one's best and recognize it's a gradual process and do it to the best of one's ability according to one's circumstances. Mm. Okay, thank you, Pante. Okay, Sumina, you can go. Pante, in one of the other sutta, uh, the Buddha say karma is the fuel, consciousness is the seed, and craving is the moisture. And I think putting craving as the middle 
uh, seem to be make sense in this particular sutta because uh, the wise one don't stick um, in the middle. So it's, it's, just, it's just my my thought on it. Uh, repeat it, I didn't quite catch it. Uh, um, but then in another sutta, the Buddha said, karma is the field, consciousness is yeah. the seed, and craving is the moisture. Yeah. And I thought that like because uh, craving is the moisture, so if we put craving in the middle, in this particular sutta, it will solve the problem. It makes sense. Yeah, actually, that's a good idea. Yeah, putting craving in the middle shows how one ties the two ends together. Actually, that makes good sense. But that's not what the sutta says, but I think your suggestion makes good sense. Okay, Vandana. Yeah, thank you, Bhante. So I'm just going to make a comment. So I, I can connect this sutta with the, uh, when what uh, Buddha says to the bhaya. By, uh, there was a Brahmin, the bhaya. Buddha gave very short teachings. So see what you see, hear what you hear. So don't let anything happen in the middle. <clears throat> so not, no craving, no clinging in the middle. Just uh, hear what somebody says and let it go right away so there is no new existence occurs. That's how I'm trying to connect the two things together. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, you could, yeah, you could connect with many other suttas. Mm -hmm. Okay, next will be, Fra uh, I think that's Franz Lee. Oh, hi, Bhante. Yeah. Um, traditionally, we associate the term middle with the Eightfold Path, the middle way. And basically, the Buddha is trying to teach um, staying away from uh, sensual indulgence and self-modification. But here, middle seems to mean different things. And what 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 is your thought about that? Okay, it actually had occurred to me that we could extend this principle of not holding to either end and not getting stuck in the middle, but could give it various applications. And one application, it actually occurred to me when preparing for this class, we could take one end, these are not the, the explanations offered in the sutta, but one end can be the end of sensual indulgence. The other end is the end of self-mortification the extreme ascetic practices. And then the middle way is the Noble Eightfold Path. And so the Buddha will say that you avoid the two extremes and you don't get stuck in the middle, which means you practice the Noble Eightfold Path, but you practice it without clinging to it. And then to illustrate this, I, this was a, some of the texts that I had compiled I didn't have time to introduce them, but let me just go through. Um, Yeah, so this is in the Majjhima Nikaya Sutta number 140, where the Buddha is speaking to a, a monk about how he develops an extreme high degree of equanimity. And equanimity is said to be purified and bright. And he says, if he were to direct it to the base of infinite space, the base of infinite consciousness, the base of nothingness, base of neither perception nor non-perception, this would be conditioned. And so this would be probably this equanimity that's referred to here as purified and bright is the equanimity of the fourth jhana, the meditative absorption, fourth meditative absorption. And so he develops that equanimity, but he doesn't 
direct that equanimity to anything conditioned. And so then it says he doesn't form any condition or generate any volition tending towards either existence or non-existence. That could be understood as the two extremes or two ends. One end is existence, one end is non-existence. So he doesn't direct that equanimity towards any either of those two extremes and doesn't cling to anything in the world. So he doesn't cling even to that equanimity. And then when he doesn't cling to that equanimity, then he's not agitated without agitation, then he attains Nibbana. And so this is that not clinging with respect to, you could say with, with respect to right samadhi, sama samadhi, and then another passage from Majjhima number 38, this is not clinging to right view. So the Buddha says that this view, and it's the view of dependent origination, is purified and bright, but if you were to adhere to it, in other words, to cling to it, then you would fail to understand that the Dhamma is like a raft, is for the purpose of crossing over, not something to be grasped, but then if you don't cling to it, then you would understand that the Dhamma is like a raft for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping. Okay, I see that there are some other hands, but let's see, let me just see if we could take maybe one more question. I've lost. Oh, okay. So, Chair Wang will take. Chair Chair Wang. Thank you, Bante, for teaching. Um, I wanted to verify my understanding with you and see whether you agree that. Mm -hmm. One end, the other end, the middle, my take is something talk about karma. Um, so you're talking about rupa, which is the five aggregates. This is a one end. Um, that's actually the result of previous cause of karma. And when you come to the five aggregates, you have an option to uh, make a decision like cultivate a noble path. And there's a chance of a success, succession in the middle. So once we reach the succession, we are liberated. However, if we, if we let the craving continue to do the seamstress work, we'll, we will actually reach the other end, which is another origin of the causes is going to start so that another cycle of a karma will start. Yeah, actually, I'm that's a good that idea. Go on. I'm wondering if that makes sense to you. That sounds good. It sounds like a good interpretation. Again, it's not in the text itself, but it's. Um, it seems that the text is sort of open-ended and you could um, fill it in in different ways, ways that are not mentioned by the monks here. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I think we're going to we're, we're going to have to end for the day. And so we'll end with the sharing of the merits. Okay, so I'm going to recite the verses for the sharing of the merits with the devas and nagas and other beings. Akasata chabumata Deva Naga Mahidika Punyanta Manumoditva Chirang Rakantu Sasanang Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Mahidika Punyanta Manumoditva Chirang Rakantu Desanang Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Mahidika Punyanta Anumoditva Chirangra Kantu Mangparang 
Dukkha pata chani dukkha, Bhaya pata chani bhaya, Soka pata chani soka, Hantu sabe pi pani no. May those in suffering be free from suffering. May those in fear be free from fear. May those in sorrow be free from sorrow. May all living beings also be thus. And then we're going to do end with three bows to the Buddha. So I'll use the chime. Okay, ready? Okay. And about to Bante, thank you, Bante Bodhi. Okay, so thank you, thank you, everybody thank you, for joining. Thank you, Bante. Thank, thank you, Bante. Bante. Have a good lunch. Thank you, Bante. 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 Thank you for a wonderful teaching. Yeah, I know. Thanks, Bunty.